first of all, you can hear when it's the wrong note. You know, mm-hmm. that's the most important thing. Hopefully, in fact, I I was when I was from like ten years old. I used to live in the music stores. I used to take tube into the town. I would be in Soundside, Musique Bush, and whatever, whatever. The great stores, you know, they had everything. And I would sit there, plug in. I would like play, and you know, sometimes you would tell me, "Turn down, you're scaring away the customers." <laughs> And then sometimes would be kids coming in. I'm not knocking anybody. I'm just saying that how I, from the very beginning, played with my ears. Yeah. I would have kids. There were kids who would come in with their dad or whatever, and they would plug in and they'd play. <laughs> they would bend the string because that was oh, it's cool to bend the string. But they would bend the string, not to a note that you want to hear, you know. Right. And I was. I, I used to call them sound side guitar players because the store was called sound side. And uh, that was the first thing that I realized, you know, that if you want that the band string has to be the same note, you know, whatever, whatever you do. And, you know, same thing with vibrato. I was always very conscious about the vibrato. I don't like a fast one, you know. And once I realized, you know, how the notes are in the scales, and if it's a minor and a major, it's the same thing. A minor and C major is the same thing. And then you can go into a little more advanced stuff, like if A minor, harmonic minor, mm-hmm. is the same as E Phrygian. And the E Phrygian in, the, in the, the, the major third, you can do diminished. It's all, it's like a puzzle, but it's not, because it's all simple, it's math. So it, 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 it didn't take me very long to figure that out. It was just a matter of me figuring out different figures, different patterns are within. Okay, so when did you start becoming aware of other rock bands and things like that? So when I grew up in school, there was there, there, there were rock bands that were very popular. It was a band called The Sweet, okay. which I thought were pretty good, you know. Yeah, I remember Sweet. Uh, Kiss, everybody loved them. Yep. Alice Cooper, mm-hmm. um, Status Quo. Yeah, oh yeah. I'd never heard Sabbath. I never heard Led Zeppelin. Okay, why? No, I don't know. But every kid in school had them in Japan. They probably made in Japan. There wasn't one kid that didn't have them, you know. And then when I got a little older, I would go to parties, you know. You go to little parties. So it's like, he said, we have a party, you know, or oh, whatever. You go to a party with all that music going on. And then I would hear, they would play um, Thin Lizzy. Yeah. Thin Lizzy was good. I liked that Wait a minute, I wonder if, the, if it's because Led Zeppelin and Sabbath, did they not tour in Sweden? I have no idea. Another freaky thing. Is that when I came to America in 1982, yep. I never ever heard of Foreigner. Okay. I never heard of Journey. Wow. Can you believe this? Uh, no, I can't. I mean, believe these that. guys are like, and I love both of them. I think they're amazing. Yeah. But but I never heard of them. Wow. It wasn't because I wasn't. I mean, because I mean, it's in the music. I was yeah. everywhere. You know? Yeah. Back then, uh, music groups and acts had very selective markets. Wow. It's that's crazy. I'd like to take a second to talk to you about this channel. This is actually Rick Beato too. I've had it since the beginning of my main channel and many of you are not subscribed. As a matter of fact, 87% of the people that watch this channel regularly are not subscribed. So I encourage you to hit the subscribe button on this channel and on my main channel. This will help me get even more of my dream guests and help continue to grow both channels. Thank you. I became a bit of a snob. I had gone to that point where I was really like, rock and roll, no. I listened to Johann Sebastian Bach, Antonio Vivaldi, Nicola Paganini, that's it. For one exception, my drummer brought a record to the studio. Oh, this is a new band, you gotta hear this. Like, not interested. I look at it. This guy's playing a new Strat, it's got a black pickguard. I was like, <laughs> totally picky. We listened to the album, Van Halen 1. It was like somebody dropped a fucking bomb, you know? Yeah. And it was so good. Yeah. So that was, that really knocked me out. Uh, but the funny thing is, like, it, it wasn't the eruption solo. It wasn't uh, the amazing guitar playing that really knocked me out. It was their attitude. Like, we're going in the studio, we're recording live. Yeah. I mean, that to me, it was just such an inspiration. I liked that a lot, you know. So I basically decided I'm never going to... I will also record everything live from now on, you know. When did this term neoclassical I, I didn't make it up. I know. When did people start saying it? Though? Well... So this is funny. I'm gonna jump a little bit forward, a little time-space continuum here. Yeah. Uh, in 1980, 
83 or January 84 or something like this, I was in Japan with another band and the label in Japan freaked out. They freaked out. And they said, we must give you solo record. Okay, cool, you know, whatever. I like that. So I got a solo deal and I was still touring with this band, right? And I would go home for one day and I would record the solo and actually I took about a week to do the basic tracks. We recorded with a Stevie Wonder's mobile truck. It's really funny. I drummed in from Jethro Tull on there. Um, and then I had to go back and, and do some solos and stuff like this. And then the band I was in, it was, it was an inevitable demise, you know. I had to go because it wasn't working out. And I went back to the studio and I finished it, this solo album, the first one. Mm -hmm. And then I started what's supposed to be my first album. Because this solo album was a Japanese only deal, only deal. Okay. But during this time, that first recording hit the Billboard charts without promotion, without being properly released. It was on, on import. You had to go and order it in a music record store back then, a record store, pay $80 or something, and wait for two weeks to get it. And just from that, it sold enough to go top 50 or something crazy like this that the label decided we have to release this. So when this album came out, it had a very Im big impact, which wasn't, I didn't expect that at all. I just yeah, threw some shit on it, you know, old songs basically, except a couple of new ones. And that's when I first heard the term neoclassic. What did you think when you heard that term? I, I didn't think much about it. I didn't think much either way, you know. Right. I mean, to me, it's, just, it, it's not important. It's the weirdest thing because all my life in Sweden growing up, I was so, I'm like, oh, like, like so determined and relentless. And like, it's like, I'm gonna do this. And everybody was saying, ha ha ha, you're never gonna make it. You know, <laughs> the Swedish uh, people, they're, well, you know, you better get a real job. You know, you're never gonna make it. But like, you can't play that. You can't play those things. You gotta play normal stuff. Right. And I just decided to be even more crazy and more heavier and faster, whatever. When I first came to the States, I remember like it was yesterday, I joined a band called Steeler for, I think I was in the band for about f two weeks. But it was very fast, two weeks, you know. We do a show at, uh, called Reseda Club, Reseda Country Club. It was 30 people there. Okay. The next couple of days, a weekend or whatever, it was just only a few days later, we're playing the Troubadour. And I'm standing, tuning up like this, looking down the window, and I see the like, line cross the block, I mean, around the whole street. I don't know, wow. And somebody working, I say, hey, hey, who's playing tonight? And the guy goes, you are. <laughs> and it was the craziest thing. One show in front of 30 people. And every, we played the Roxy, whiskey, the whatever, that's every night. So after all these years of you being told, get a job. If the weirdest thing was when I was still in Sweden, I couldn't get a record deal. Nobody could take me seriously, but I had fans. Mm -hmm. We would do shows. We'd have flash pots and burning guitars and stuff. Okay. We'd be able to play in schools and cinemas and youth centers and stuff. And so it was, would always be a bunch of people coming to shows, but you know, it was like a, back then it was, uh, that was called a new wave of British heavy metal. Became a popular thing. Everybody had a leather jacket and a Saxon badge or something, you know. Mm -hmm. So they dug what I was doing. So it was really, it wasn't like, it wasn't nothing, you know. But it didn't translate into anything. But there was two things that happened right before I left. Um, I got invited to play a festival. Okay. Called Woodstock Home. Yeah. <laughs> Three days. Listen to this. <laughs> Only signed artists. Okay. Only signed artists, like m middle of the road stuff. No metal. Nothing. Okay. I was on this thing. Woodstock. I didn't get a sound check. Nothing. It was, yeah. And so I get, you know, it was me. I was the guitar player and singer and the bass player and the drummer. You know, we play heavy metal, basically. Yeah. But like this. And we do the show, and I didn't really get any vibes from nothing, you know, nothing like that. There's two newspapers in Sweden, uh, Aftonbladet and Expressen. So next morning I'm walking to the, it's like a 7-Eleven kind of thing. And in Sweden they used to have, uh, whatever was the headlines, they would have like plastered on the walls everywhere. 
the headline news were like a, a poster, you know. Something. Right. Rock show of the year. It's, I don't know, so what, you know. They're going to, the, to buy something in a convenience store and it's two stands. And there's on the front cover of one of them, I see this guy with long hair and a white strap. I'm like, that's weird. I'm like looking at him, I'm gonna buy something. I look a little closer. I go, fuck, that's me. 